This is Jerry Learns Business, and today we have an entertainment professional. This is Jack, Jack Kennedy, and he is a jack of all trades in entertainment, which by the way, Jack, I think that's a trend now more and more in kind of entertainment. People have to know how to produce and do a lot of stuff, not just act or be one thing. Yeah, you have to. If you want to get, I mean, because the tools are all there, right? You don't mm -hmm. only have to pay a studio to go edit for you. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, you can shoot on your iPhone. And you just need to be able to do it because that's how content's being made, especially with all the on the mobile sites and YouTube being so popular and other platforms, of course, which, exactly. you, know, you, you know, all those pretty well. because you're, you're doing it all yourself. Yeah. 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 And Jack, let's go through kind of your history. So when did you discover you want to dis do something in entertainment? I want to say I knew in the fourth grade when mm -hmm. uh, I auditioned to be the lion in the uh, Wizard of the production of the Wizard of Oz and Sarah Rahal beat me out. And then she, uh, I had these big dreams and I was so crushed. I got stuck being Uncle Henry. Mm. And, uh, you know, and then when Sarah Rahal, it was the final, it was the only, if I only had the Noive song mm. and the curtains, it was like the curtains were coming down and she started laughing and she couldn't get through the song and the, and the, and the curtains closed on her. And I was so angry. I said, I could have done better than her mm. and I'm going to show her. Mm. So really this is all about showing Sarah Rahal that I should have been the Cowardly Lion. Nice, nice. Nice. <laughs> Did you end up doing Wizard of Oz in the future and playing the lion? No, no, I never got to, but mm. you know, maybe one day. <laughs> maybe that's a collab for us. We can do like a Wizard of Oz parody or something like that. That'd be, I, I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so uh, you had the Sarah Hall thing. When did you take your first acting class or your first kind of music class? Tell me about that. Yeah, no, I never had. I, I did a couple plays. I really, really the start of me wanting to be an actor was uh, – yeah, it, again, I went back to childhood, junior in high school. I was, I was really depressed. I was kind of down. And my mom said, hey, the local theater, this is Decatur, Alabama, they're doing a, a production of Alice in Wonderland. Just go audition. Mm -hmm. So I went and auditioned, and I got the part of the mock turtle. And then uh, and then I just started doing plays from there and, you know, did Grease senior in high school. And then, uh, you know, I went off to West Point, which is a very renowned uh, musical theater academy. Mm -hmm. Uh, just kidding. It's the military academy. <laughs> I, I was I was grossly misinformed about my acting future, mm -hmm. but I always knew. But you know, so I was doing that, and I had a, you know I owed time in the army afterwards. But I, I knew acting was going to be part of my path. I, I just had I, so I think in high school I started. I, I really knew I wanted to do that, and fortunately, life opened the doors for me to do it. And, and I didn't take my first acting class until I got here to uh, Los Angeles, and probably 1996 I came out here the first time around, wow. and. The guy who was my first acting teacher is now my teacher again, a guy called named Gail Hansen. He was he played the role of Charlie Dalton or Nwanda in Dead Poets Society oh. uh, back in the day. So he and he had a hot little career for a few, a couple of years and then had some car accidents and then kind of took him out. And then he ended up being an executive. Uh, and now I recently talked him into coming back to teach acting. So we're, we're doing that now. And, and he's just absolutely fabulous. That's awesome. Um, so, Let's go back a little. So you were at West Point. You so you're a military veteran. Yes, I am. Wow, wow, wow. That first of all, that's awesome. Thank you, thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, do you find that helped kind of like cater certain roles to you? Like you know, uh, looking at your vibe, I'm like, ooh, if I were to cast him in like a tough guy role or like even leading man that's got an edge type role, he'd be perfect. Do you find the military kind of helped you with defining sort of your image? Uh, I don't. No, not really. Um, and a lot of guys, it does, but I think it's, for instance, I, there was a show called The Unit <laughs> back on the day. I, I think it was maybe CBS, I'm not sure, but uh, mm -hmm. military show. And, and I, I auditioned for that once. And I, first time I read it, they said, oh, it's, that's too military. I, then they asked me to read it again. They're like, still too military. <laughs> and I read a third time and they just said, thank you. Goodbye. And I think it was just I'm like, how can I be, this is a military role. How can I be too military? How yeah. Be an authentic. So it, Hollywood has a different version of what military guys yeah. are, right? Yeah, sure. Really uh, but the thing is, they also come in all kinds of, and, and I think I do, when I grow my beard out, I'll, I'll grow a beard down here. And without fail, someone will come up to me and ask me if I was special forces. Mm. Because that has come out, you know, the, yeah. with all the Navy SEALs movies, and that's kind of the popular image now. Um but again, I, I don't know that it's helped me because it's, it's still no matter what your vibe is or who you are, someone has to just find you, right? And someone yeah. has to recognize that. You have to get into the right doors, yeah. which is always the challenge of 
of this business is getting yeah. in the right door, getting the right contacts. Yeah. When do you think you kind of got in the door, so to speak, or got the right contacts or, you know, I, I personally don't even think I I'm there yet. So it's so totally okay. If you feel like oh, you're still kind of like trying to figure out this Hollywood machine. Yeah, no, no I, I am. I'm still kind of stuck for, you know, I've done over, over 20 TV shows, but there's still <laughs> a lot of, one of them was an ex special forces guy. That was one I did a role on castle a couple of episodes. Mm-hmm. And, but other than that, I'm stuck as the a big guy with a shaved head. And usually mm. it's, you know, they want a, a prison guard or something. All right, bye bye, buddy. <laughs> my boy, Jerry. Hello. Right, Hello. You, hi to Jerry. Say hi. <laughs> All right. I love you, buddy. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, oh, yeah. Um, so, no, I, I, I'm stuck in, I'm kind of pigeonholing these roles with a big guy with a shaved head. And mm. it's hard to get to do the real acting that I, you know, I continually prove that I could do that in, in class and just mm-hmm. some of the stuff I've done and even some of the theater I've done. But it's hard to get that opportunity. Once once a casting director or business, the Hollywood sees you as one thing, it's hard to break through that so-called glass ceiling and get to the next level. Yeah, I, I totally feel you, man. Um, I guess for me, I'm blessed because um, if I take off my glasses and shave my head, it's a different look. And then if I put on glasses and grow out the hair, it's a different look. So yeah. I can do two things. I can do like nerdy and I can do gangster Asian. So I guess I'm pigeonholed in two of them. <laughs> it's better than one. Well, cause yeah. when I grow my hair, it just looks like it's the uh, it classic inner tube around the head like this uh, bald on top. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I look about 10 years older and it's, it's a bad look. I see. Well, your current look is good. So Thanks. also the cigar really adds to it too. So I like the cigar. Give me, give me a cigar and a scotch and I'm a happy man. That's right. Um, so to viewers watching, um, I got in touch with Jack through Ted. And at that time, Jack was doing a Indiegogo for a, a movie called You Are Here. So Jack, tell me more about that. You Are Here has been a long, a long journey. And so the seed of it was uh, my first, I, I mentioned I was, this is my second time around in Los Angeles, but the first time I life was just, I was managing this really crappy apartment building in Hollywood, really seedy, you know, like basically mm. in crack alley. Mm. And um, acting was, nothing was happening. Acting, it just everything seemed to be just in a downward spiral. And mm-hmm. I had won a trip. I was bachelor number two on the dating game. And I, I got picked, the bachelorette picked me and we went, won a trip to Lake Tahoe. Mm-hmm. Never met up with the bachelorette. I called the dating game and said, hey, can I take this by myself? And they're like, yeah, sure, go ahead. And I was a bouncer in a bar called the Derby. It was a famous swing dance club from Swingers. It was featured in Swingers. Oh. That back in the day. And I was working there. And so the night, next morning, I was flying up to Tahoe to take this trip. In comes this girl visiting from New York City. I meet her. Bar closes down. We go hang out at an after party. And it's like 6 in the morning. I said, all right, well, you want to come to Lake Tahoe with me? Or I'm never going to see you again. Mm-hmm. She came to Tahoe with me had a great weekend, fell in love. And a month later, like life was pretty bad. I woke up one morning, I flipped the coin. I said, Hey, heads, I'm going to move to New York city. Tails, I'm going to move to Austin. Cause mm-hmm. I had an agent who wanted to represent me, but he was in Austin and, uh, came up heads. I called this girl in New York and said, Hey, I'm going to move to New York. She's like, okay. So I packed up all my, I packed up my car, then 87 miles outside of town in San Bernardino up in Yucaipa. Uh, my engine blew up. Oh, and I, and I got stranded living at this, I got towed to this mechanic and he had a, this old Winnebago, 68 Winnebago behind his shop. And he put me up there, let me, cause I was broke. I couldn't go get a hotel or anything. Mm-hmm. So he puts me up there and then he just flounders around, not fixing my car. It took him nine and a half days wow. to fix my car. And uh, so it was quite an adventure. He's one of the all time great characters. So anyway, I left when I drove out of that town. Finally, I said, this is a story. I'm writing this one day. And so that seed of that concept became the you are here, which is about this, you know, this alcoholic broken down writer who thinks he can go find his muse in New York and he gets stranded in this tiny town and the the mechanic becomes his muse. Mm. And so I did the Indiegogo campaign at that time, uh, got some investors on board, right? Got some raised about a little over 40,000, got some investors on board. Then that investors fell through. Those investors fell through as mm. always happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's been the, and then I got Judd Nelson attached. If people may or may not, he's more of our generation. He works, he's a fantastic actor, but for those of you who don't know, he was in the breakfast club. He's part of the Brat Pack back in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and still a fantastic actor, but he loved it. And he's like, yeah, I want to play. So he's going to play the mechanic. Mm -hmm. So he's been on board for almost like the last five years now. Uh, unfortunately, how Hollywood works is you need, there's only very few people who can get a movie made, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, Judd's not really one of them. He's just a, a nice piece to have. So it's still trying to find the money. Um, and I have like, and so it's, I can't tell you how many times, like this was, a, it was the script was a semifinals for the uh, um, Academy Nichols Fellowship, which is run by the Academy Awards. It's, it's renowned as the most prestigious screenwriting competition. Um, and it, you know, placed in some others. And so, and every time, and even some producers have read it and they'd be like, Jack, I love this. I just can't make any money off it. Mm. And that's the thing, because it's a small indie type of thing and they want the $60 million action film that they want to mm -hmm. film, right? So that's, it's kind of caught in there, but uh, it's a matter of getting that one break. Right before COVID happened, I did a stage reading of it. And I got some great actors. It was Judd, Condi Alexander, who was on series regular on CSI Miami, mm -hmm. you know, like a guy named Jamie Kaler, I think Gruba, all these people who have, they're not names, but they've all been on TV series and they have, you know, they've been working in the business for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And it went great. We had over a hundred people, just people were laughing. And it was just, it went really well. A couple of producers came up to me afterwards and says, Hey, this, this really has to get made. And then two days later, it was locked down for COVID. Mm -hmm. And so nothing has moved forward. I see. Uh, so just like another, you know, <laughs> another monkey wrench thrown in there. Yeah. Um, and we'll see. I, yeah, it, it's going to happen at some point. It's just a matter of, of how and and am I going to just do a shoestring budget and film it for nothing on my own, um, which I might have to do. But I'd rather I think it's worthy of getting some money behind it. Yeah, makes sense. What do you think of using Indiegogo? Because originally you did an Indiegogo crowdfunding. And I think crowdfunding is like past its like, what is it? Like hot period. Like it was the thing back in like 2012, yeah. 2013, 2014. But now people are just like, yeah, crowdfunding, yeah, right? What was your experience using Indiegogo? Uh, my experience, well, first of all, the platform, I, I didn't, didn't end up loving the platform because if you don't meet your, stated goal you end up paying like nine percent in fees or something yeah like pretty big yeah. um but I, I what i really want to do and, and I, here's where i think they change the laws so i mean i was successful it's basically me out there pushing it by myself and we raised over forty thousand, which is pretty good for a, a one-man operation yeah um in order to be successful in those i think you really need a team of people yeah 100 it, it's all about those the context of the context you need that um but what I really wanted to do is offer, you know, hey, if you're put in 500 bucks and you get a piece of the film, right, you're investing in it. And I think you weren't allowed to do it at the time. I think laws, the like SEC change of financial laws, and I believe you can now do that. Mm -hmm. Almost like the crowdfunding, but people are getting a stake instead of, hey, here's your T-shirt as, as a your reward. Uh, people can actually buy a stake in it. And that's I think that's a much better way of, of crowdfunding where people can be investors and have a true interest in it. Because I know, you know, if my friends were, if, if I loved a film they're doing, I would put 500, you know, by no means wealthy. I can't put up, you know, 50 grand for them, but I'd put 500 bucks in and have a tiny piece of the, you know, and just, cause that's a fun thing I think for investors and you have more of a rooting interest. Yeah. Yeah. And I know before the lockdown happened, I think the exact topic you're talking about, my roommate was telling me about that too. Something about the laws changed. And now there's some way, and it's probably, you could use Indiegogo, but there's even specialized platforms just for this, where just it's literally like, you know, it's like a certain limit. You can only contribute as an individual up to a few thousand, I believe, or something. It's not that much, but it's like literally you get a little bit of an actual equity or stake in something like a creative project. And I think that's a really good idea. Exactly like you said, Jack, because some people don't want the shirt. They just want to feel like they're appreciated. And one way to feel appreciated is maybe they'll see a little bit of royalties for many years, right? Just a little bit, right? right? Yeah. That's better than a t-shirt. And you get to say, hey, uh, you can kind of, it's the whole Line at a cocktail party. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a, I've invested in a movie. I yeah, yeah, I, I produced. I helped the executive produce the movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, how do you feel about the? Uh, how do you feel about the crowdfunding platforms now? What have you seen evolve? Because you're more connected to that. Now. Yeah. So, um, my kind of experience with that, I think it kind of lost its way. Um, so, how I had success with YouTube was that I really specialized 
And so what I did was, you know, I have a really big channel on martial arts and on that channel, it's only martial arts. And now YouTube yeah. is forcing me to specialize even more. So it's not just a martial arts channel anymore. It has to be a specific type of martial art. Now, the reason I'm saying this is because the problem when you have too much going on and YouTube struggling, Facebook is too struggling with this. When there's too much of an ecosystem, people get lost in it. And I think that's the problem with these crowdfunding platforms is that I don't know if I'm going to get any attention if I'm some dude wanting to raise funds for, you know, some soap I'm designing when I'm competing against this singer, this author, you know, this screenplay, this person trying to design a tech product. You see where the disconnect is? So I think, and I thought it was going to go in this direction, but it never did. I thought what would happen was the crowd for the crowd funding platforms would get more and more specialized. So the authors would have a special author platform and all the people who like books and stuff would have that. And so it would be more specialized and maybe that's actually where it's going to go. But I don't even go on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or anything anymore. I used to like browse them. You know, when, when we got in touch, I used to be really into it, as you know, but I, I don't even go on them anymore because at a certain extent, I was just like, huh, huh, hmm. And then the other thing I liked what you said about Indiegogo, I love that they kind of punish you. If you like, don't reach your goal, you like pay more. And <laughs> yeah. that, that seems a little, but I remember seeing that. And I'm like, Ugh. so yeah, that's kind of, because they had like the full funding, right? The, f- the full funding is if you reach it, you get all the money. If you don't, you don't get any of the money. Right. And then the flexible, like the flexible, it's flexible, but you also pay way more out of your pocket to like get the fee. So um, I also met the person who founded Indiegogo. Oh, I don't know if I ever told you this story, but um, I met the person who founded Indiegogo and um, he actually was an alum from my school and he wasn't that nice to me. So again, he probably was just having a bad day, but that really soured it too, because I was such a big, I, I loved, you know, crowdfunding. I wanted to talk to him and he just kind of blew me off. So, you know, all these things together, I'm like, eh, crowdfunding, maybe not the right way. And let's think about it like this, Jack, I'm sure you have serious experience doing this, but it's draining. Like you said, you need a team, man. It drains your soul to try to like get, you're working too hard to get a few people to give you five bucks, man. Yeah, it, it does that. And you know, and also the flip side of it, like I said, I, I thought raising over 40 grand was fairly successful. Um, had to, We had probably had 350 people donate, right? Yeah. And all kind of connections directly through me. Um, and then, and I haven't gotten the project off the ground since then. So there's also this kind of this extreme guilt that weighs on me. Mm. I mean, partly that's who I am. And partly because these were, a lot of these just friends and to not be able to get it off the ground yet. It And I mean, that's why I will, I, I know I'm going to do it no matter what, mm-hmm. uh, even if it's shoestring budget eventually, because I know I, I maybe it's good because I feel like, so I have to give them something. Yeah. But then there's also the guilt trip side of it where you feel bad about letting people down. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, which is why, I mean, hopefully maybe we'll have to look at this afterwards is it'd be nice if like you're saying, getting specific, if, if there was a website and there was people uh, raising money and you get a little bit of equity and you can donate starting at maybe a hundred bucks for a movie or 500 bucks, I would tool through and I would see some movies I might like. And I would throw, I would fund some money and then yeah. just kind of watch them over the next couple of years and see, see what happens. Yeah. That would be incredible. And, and same thing if there's just, you know, I want to see a, a, a book or something published by someone, you know, I like the premise or I like the children's book that I see illustration of like, yeah, let me, let me donate to that or be an investor in it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's where everything's going to go. So I think you and me need to do a follow-up, maybe whatever website we find or whatever platform we'll like look through all of them, do like a reaction together of like the best ones we see. And maybe we'll, we'll both like do a bid. We'll be like, okay, how much am I willing to pay for this? How much am I willing to invest in this? That'd be kind of a cool follow-up video. Let's do that. Let's, let's, let's do that research and do it. Definitely. So Jack, I think this is a perfect segue because you mentioned children's books. Um, you're, you've published a children's book, right? Tell me about that. I did. Well, I have it right here. Mm-hmm. The Cow Who Lost Her Moo. Mm-hmm. The cow who lost mm-hmm. um, This was an idea. I, I wrote this many years ago, and it was just a manuscript sitting around in my just on my computer. And I had researched a couple because I wrote a couple others, and I, I researched the children's industry, book industry, publishing industry. Mm-hmm. It is really tough. I mean, mm-hmm. you're not because a lot of the publishing houses they'll pair an author with a, an illustrator, and you're going through them and it's a whole rigmarole. And, and again, it's, it's access, right? You need a, a children's book agent to get you to a publisher. You need to you know someone at a publisher. 
So like all these endeavors, in the, especially in the creative industries, you need connections. It doesn't matter. Your talent is almost, it doesn't matter. You got to have the talent when you get there, but you need the connections. And so earlier this year, I was just like, you know, I'd had, I just had my second kid. And I was like, you know what? I just want this to be out there. It's on my bucket list of things. Like I, I you know, I checked into my bucket list and on there is publish a children's book. And I'm like, I'm just going to self-publish it. So I did all the research and I got my friend to do the illustrations, Jennifer Cornett. She's out of Ohio and wonderful illustrator. And we just kind of went back and forth and, you know, and, and, and that was actually 2019, we were doing the illustrations. And then this year I said, all right, I'm just going to self-publish it. So I bit the bullet, I paid the chunk and uh, then created the website and just started trying to sell it on my own. I uh, see. But the story itself, it's a metaphor for happiness. And it came from years ago, I was actually in Santa Monica sitting at a cafe and my buddy looks at me and says, Jack, you look like the cow who lost her milk. So I was all bummed out. I'm like, it's a great metaphor for happiness. Mm. And it had been on my mind ever since. And so that's the whole, that's the point of the book is that the moral is that the, your moo is always inside you. You know, you, we spend all these times, we get a little bit down. You, you, maybe you've done it before and you're like, what's wrong? What's missing from my life? How, what can I go buy or what do I need to do uh, to, to go kind of get my happiness back? And it's really just kind of right inside you, right? It's yeah. normal to feel have some ups and downs to be a little bit down for absolutely no reason. I used to get all, I'd be all like, for instance, I, I shared the story about being a little bit depressed when I was in high school and my mom said, go audition for this Alice in Wonderland. And I did it. And, but at the same time, I, I was so, at that time, I was like, I don't know why, why am I, I was bummed at myself for being bummed out. <laughs> mm. I was and it was, there was nothing wrong in my life. It was just kind of a natural cycle of what you go through. Yeah. And I didn't realize that. And I was all worried. I had to go do something to find it. And I didn't really need to. Yeah. So that's what the book's about. That's great. And I think it's great to teach kids that in an accessible way. Because sometimes kids, I, I even remember growing up there. I, I spent time in Chicago, right? In Chicago, oh, sure. certain days in the winter time, you know how it is. Like the sun will come up for three hours and go back down, man. Yeah. And like, like, like I think about that now, I'm just like, Chicago is not even that much North, but so imagine what Canadians or like Norwegians have to deal with. It's crazy. But I, I will never forget that like one week, every winter in Chicago where the sun would come up for three hours and go back down. It was the most depressing thing. And as a kid, you don't understand those feelings, but you feel it. You're like, oh, this doesn't feel normal. And then um, sometimes in class, I'd be like, suddenly I feel a dip in my emotions and like I, I couldn't process it. So I would just be like, okay, I notice it. Let's try to make sense of this years later. And I remember like, see, I'm still trying to make sense of it, but, yeah. but like, I wish I had a book like this because the books we read were all like, you know, like, I don't remember what we read back in the day, like Amelia Bedelia. I remember reading stuff like that. Right. Yeah. That, that was just like goofy stuff. It wasn't something that was serious, but accessible. Yeah. Well, and I hope so. Cause you know, I mean, that is, that's something I'm trying to teach you that's my three-year-old who popped mm -hmm. in earlier. Yeah, he gets he gets sad. You you don't know why. And as a parent, you're a little not frustrated. You just you're you're worried for him in this nap. But I also want to, I do. I want to teach him that hey, this is just it, it's part of life. Yeah. Don't make it worse by being trying to figure out some answer. Just oftentimes, right? It's go get a good night's sleep. Hey, change. You know, have a little bit better diet. Or whatever. Yeah. Get out, get out and see some sunlight. I think that's sunlight COVID, so right? important. People aren't doing that and people are getting, there's the depression levels have, have spiked because people aren't doing, they're not exercising, they're not getting outside. Yeah. And, and those things are so important. Yeah. Um, so you can't think that there's anything wrong with you just for being a little bit. That's just, that, that's life. And yeah. You're going to be okay. And sometimes coffee <laughs> helps a lot. Coffee, <laughs> Cigars cigar. like you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I think it's, it's super interesting talking about just, this is something that I think, every creative person needs to just be honest about because I think the flip side of creativity is a little bit of madness or sadness, right? It like runs the, it kind of flows. So you, part of what we're doing as creatives is controlling that madness. So it comes out in productive forms, but you have to know that that quote unquote madness is always kind of emerging in other ways. So don't let it kind of exactly like you said, Jack, don't judge it. Don't be like, I'm feeling sad. Therefore, I need to judge myself and feel more sad. Or why, why is this? It's just, it just happens, you know, just go in the sun and just like um, meditate or pray and do other things, but don't judge it. Well, even I was listening to uh, 
not to advertise Tim Ferriss podcast here, but he had Jerry Seinfeld on his interview mm. recently. And, and, and Jerry, obviously one of the top comedians, if you don't know who he is, mm-hmm. uh, but he talked about, he, he, he still, he's insanely successful. He's like in his sixties, he's still thriving. He's touring. And he's like, yeah, I still get down all the time. It's just part of who it's part of the creative process almost. Mm-hmm. And it, it is because we, as creators, we do, we, we're a little more emotional. And I think part of that is just, if you know you're creative and you're an emotional person, accept the highs and lows and kind of, you know, enjoy them. Just take it for what they are yeah. because it is part of the process. I think. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Um, I think the other really cool segue from this book that you wrote is the self-publishing process, because I think everyone has like a book idea or maybe even a written memo or something, or memoir or something. Right. And um, how did you self-publish? Was it through Amazon? Was it kind of another company? Tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, there was a, uh, there, there's several companies out there that you can use and, and they all have, you know, like I, I got pricing from like four or five different places mm-hmm. and um, I went ahead. I didn't end up going up out with the, ch- the cheapest. I just went with the one who I, they're all, you know, some are really expensive and I, I went with a pretty modest one. Um, and honestly, you know what? Their name is even escaping me right now, which mm-hmm. I use. But what I ended up doing was getting it down to where for the whole process of the layout and then printing. And I, I went ahead and I, I printed a thousand books um, because it got my price down to basically $9 and 50 cents a book. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I can sell them. You know, if I sell it for 18 99, I can make a couple bucks when I, you know, I, I pay my illustrator then ship, you know, it costs almost, it costs like th- almost three bucks to mail them. You know, it, so there's a lot of expenses that go in and mar- margins very slim. Mm-hmm. That's why, but like a, if a big house, a big publisher does this, they can get it down to like four bucks, three or $4 per book. And then that's how they can really make money off it. So it's, it, you're not going to make money doing it yourself more than likely, unless you do get it successfully on Etsy or Amazon, but that's a whole nother marketing world. You have to understand that. I don't necessarily understand how to be found in that, in the weeds. Um, my hope is getting a, my hope is getting a, a publisher to reckon to see the book and say, Oh yeah, we like this. You've done all the work. Let's just take it and we'll print it. Yeah. So I, I've been sending out query letters to publishing houses to try to get that done. Um, I'd say the self publishing realm, I think why you do it. I was fortunate enough to have enough, enough money to be able to do that. Um, so their money is always a factor. But even if you did it and you you printed a, a you know fifty books and maybe you spend you know a thousand dollars doing it, which seems really expensive, <laughs> it is. But it, it's, if it's a bucket list or it's, it's part of your dream, and you just need to get it out there. I think it's a great way to do it instead of sitting around because what we what can we do? We we can sit around and wait for someone else to make our dreams come true. Yeah. yeah. Or we can take a step towards it, even if it's a complete failure. We've taken a step towards it, and I believe like this, I'll lose money on it. It will, maybe a publisher will pick it up and I make money, but maybe they'll open the door for me to do another children's book. It'll open some sort of door, but it, you know, more importantly, it just satisfied a creative instinct I had. And there's no longer sitting in a drawer for 20 years, like it almost did, or on my, on my laptop and me just saying, oh, maybe someday, I don't know who will do it, but no one's going to find it on your computer, right? No one's going to yeah. do it. Yeah. So I did it myself. And I, and I think that's the benefit to doing it is just doing something you know, we get one go around on this earth, right? And you can wait until you're 60, 65 or 70 and you're pulling money out of your IRA and you're living. But to me, to me, it's more important to have this dream. I'd rather have this when I'm 70, I'd rather have this cow who lost her move sitting on my desk than an extra, you know, hundred dollars coming out of my IRA. Yeah. <laughs> That's 100%. Best. I think that is such an inspiring thing for everyone watching this channel. And it really is that right? you got one go. So even if you spent, like, you really have to think about it like that. Even if you spent a thousand dollars, so what? Right. Hey, like that's just a thousand dollars. You can make that money again. It's like, <laughs> you, can. you can make it. It will yeah. come. I, and I think, you know, and I think the universe does reward you when you, listen, not to, not to get on the philosophical thing, but a couple, a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. um, I was sitting on, sitting out here on the porch and having some, uh, you know, some socially distanced uh, drinks with a couple of friends. And one of them mentioned how 
there was this Facebook friend of hers and she has a child with autism and she had written some Facebook post about canceling Christmas because she couldn't, she couldn't afford gifts. Mm -hmm. And, and my, you know, my friend says, Hey, do you have any children's toys that maybe I can send her? I'm like, I'm like, here you go. I, I went and I, I got her, I gave her a hundred dollar bill. I said, send her a gift card. Mm -hmm. um, let her buy some stuff for a kid. And literally, and again, I don't want, <laughs> we do not have a lot of money. You know, we, we kind of spend everything we make almost, but still a hundred dollars, not a huge deal in the whole scheme of life. Um, two weeks later, I did that. I'm like, okay, money's tight right now. And blah, blah, blah. Two weeks later, I got two huge residual checks for my acting in the mail for uh, $3,600. Wow. Now, mm -hmm. all right, that was in the process. That was going to come almost no matter what, you know? Mm -hmm. But to me, it was, that's just, to me, that's how the universe works. You give some money or you give your dream, the universe is going to find a way to take care of you. And I think you have to have faith in that yeah. and, and trust that that is how it will happen. I agree. I mean, um, so I, I worked at a pretty big Chinese company for a while. And um, I mean, I, and people know I worked at ByteDance, the company behind TikTok and you yeah. know, all these crazy apps destroying our youth. But, you know, when I was thinking about quitting my job and really going for it, the first thing I did was exactly what you did, Jack. I just started giving. I just started writing recommendations for everyone that I worked with. And they probably got an idea. They're like, oh, I think Jerry's probably thinking of moving on. But instead of thinking inwards, I thought outwards. I'm like, I'll take care of everyone first. And even whatever happens, whether I get taken care of or not, I at least spread something good out. That was like my philosophy always. And I don't know if it came back to, uh, to help me the way I, I thought it would, but I, I found a career on YouTube right after I quit, literally right after I quit my job, my, my fight commentary channel took off. So, you know, like it really is about kind of, don't ever be afraid of giving, I think is one of the greatest lessons. Mm -hmm. You can make it back. You can make it back, man. Money, money. It's not that it's very hard, easy to lose money, but it's also easy to make money. If you, if you just like put your mind to it, that's the thing. It's, it's money comes and goes just like the emotions, right? So don't, yeah. don't hold on to it. Don't just like emotions. Don't cling on to it. Don't cling on to money either. And it, it takes the focus off yourself and whatever you're going through, right? Because yeah. who doesn't feel good when honestly giving is kind of about how it makes you feel rather than yeah. the person. Yeah. And I, I could go spend that hundred bucks at a bar and, and drink a lot of beers and get liquored up. But I feel much better about giving yeah. that hundred dollars to someone else. Yeah. And that helps, that helps my happiness in the whole scheme of things. Yeah. But, you know, the other the flip side of that too, is like you, you're talking about you, you took the risk and a lot of people they're out there, maybe they're watching your fight channel or they're, you know, I've seen you created a lot of videos in the past. You do a, you're out there creating content though. You don't know if anyone's going to watch it or anyone's going to care if it's yeah. going to make money. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I think a lot of people do in this day and age, Oh, Hey, here's this seven year old kid. He's unboxing stuff on YouTube and he's making a million dollars a year. Oh, I wish I could do that. Okay. Well then just do it. Cause you know what? That, that kid didn't have a contract for a million dollars. He just started doing this and making the videos and people just happen to watch. So you yeah. still have to just go do it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. there's no, there's no magic pill to say, Hey, how can I get to this? What this YouTube celebrity is doing? Oh, uh, why are they doing this? Is this is silly? This guy's skateboarding, listening to whatever the, the Fleetwood Mac song, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how is that? Why is that so popular? All right. Well, he just did it, and he was having fun and joy in doing it. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't doing it to make money, but now it's paying off for him. I I think that is something that everyone needs to remember. Just do it, man. Just do it. This year, 2020, this channel, Jerry Learns Business, it's a new channel. I kept, you mentioned Tim Ferriss. I kept saying, why can't I do something like Tim Ferriss does? And then 2020 came around. I'm like, let's just do it. <laughs> so I just said, you know, let's, let's start, man. And it might take a while. It might never, but at least I have stuff out there. I, I'm doing it. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know what your next step is? Your next step is uh, sending, uh, sending Tim Ferriss a tweet or something and say, Hey, come, will you come to my. Yeah, exactly. You inspired me and let's, let's do it back. You, I interview you now. Yeah, he'll know your name a little bit. Maybe he won't respond, but then maybe he like keeps an eye on you or something. And, and a year down the road, he says, "Oh yeah, Jerry, hey, I want to be on." I, you never know. Yeah. But that's how you build things, right? You get rejected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like that concept of there's 200 no for everything you do. There's going to be 200 no's. You have to just you have to get all the no's out of the way before you get to the yes. So have fun. If you reach out to enough people or do enough things and get enough rejection, the the re acceptance is going to come. But you have to get the, you can't just, you got, that's part of the process. Like you got to get the nose out of the way. 
Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, and it, it, a funny, similar story with Joe Rogan, right? Because Joe Rogan had the original kind of podcast. He was the MMA guy. And so when I started fight commentary breakdowns, I, I reached out to him on LinkedIn. I was like, Joe, man, you're a big fan. I'd love to get you on the channel. And of course, nothing happened. But then two years later, at least it was two years or one year later. I don't remember when I reached out to him on LinkedIn, but his company tried to monetize content that didn't belong to them on my channel. And so I, I was like, oh, oh. So I reached out to the company again. I tweeted them and then he noticed, right? So, but it's like, he wouldn't have known who I was if the, the second time around, if the first time around, I didn't like reach out to him on LinkedIn. And immediately after that, I saw him, he accepted my LinkedIn request. So he like looked at my channel, uh, like my LinkedIn, and then he like unfriended me. But, uh, you know, it, you plant the seed, right? You plant the seed. So so it's like it, it, if anything happens in the future, they at least remember, oh, yeah, he, he reached out to me back in the day. <laughs> That's great. It's, yeah. and, and, and the other thing about that, like when I was doing the Indiegogo and sending out emails to acquaintances and you know people, and one guy finally wrote me back. Uh, he's a buddy I went to West Point with, and he – He's like, Jack, you know what they say in marketing? It takes seven, you have to, it takes seven touches. You have to reach out to someone seven times. He's like, and it's, it's true. Cause he hadn't responded to me at all. He's like, yeah, I find, I saw this again. I finally went through my inbox and I saw that you'd written me seven times and now I'm responding and I'm donating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it does, it still takes those rejections and, and not putting it, oh, he didn't get back to me. He wants to, it doesn't cost you anything to keep reaching out to someone yeah. to send them emails. They can ignore, it doesn't affect your life whatsoever right they can ignore yeah. you but there's only so many times they can't ignore you <laughs> yeah, that's thing. true that's yeah. true and a, a very similar note for people who are kind of reaching out let's say you want to reach out to people like me or people like jack or anyone right um don't get mad either that's another thing like you know we're talking about more like okay just giving up but like don't get mad i've had people like threaten me because it's like i didn't get back to them in time i'm like dude chill out man well now i definitely will get back to you <laughs> but like people get mad yeah all right if you're one of those who get mad go look at your inbox and see how many emails you have responded to marketing yeah. emails or whatever you have you chose to ignore them does yeah. it mean you hate the person or the company that's reached out to you? Just no, you don't. It's, you have like me, you know, I, I've got, a, I, I've got, I have two kids and a couple dogs and a wife and I, you're doing things. I'm too, it, it does, I, there's no ill will. If I ignore your email, I, I ignore yeah. emails from good friends, not intentionally. I'm just like, I'll get to it later. And maybe it doesn't happen for a couple months and I yeah. feel a little guilty, yeah. but you know, they could sit around and say, Oh, Jack didn't respond to me. I and take it personally is nothing personal whatsoever. It's just yeah. not. Yeah, exactly. A very good general life lesson. Just don't take too many things personally. <laughs> you, yeah, you can't. You'll drive. You'll you'll lose your move pretty yeah. quick if you yeah. start yeah. taking everything personally. Yeah, um, exactly. But I think you do have to look at your own behaviors too, and almost like karma. If I'm ignoring all these emails in my inbox, why should I expect someone to respond to me? Yeah. If I don't reach out to friends just for no reason, uh, except for when I need some money donated for something, or I need a favor, or I need someone to, hey, can you introduce me to your agent or your publisher? Uh, sorry, I haven't talked to you in four years. Yeah, that's no good. It's just, you gotta maintain relationships and just say, just wanna know how people, are, like at the beginning of COVID, and, what, and I, I just started reaching out and calling people a couple months in. Just yeah. say, hey, you know, hey, how you doing? You know, I know you're, you know, a lot of my buddies are just single actors living in a studio apartment in LA and mm -hmm. I know they're just going nuts. Yeah. And it's important to reach out and make those contacts so that, you know, six months down the road when you, maybe you do need something. It's not, Hey, I'm only using you. It's no, there's a general, general, genuine give and take here. And I think you have to give, do the giving if you want to take later. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. A very good follow-up question is, we all hope 2021 is going to be better. So I know 2021, if it gets better, you're going to continue with this uh, film that you're doing. What's some other plans for your creative life, your kind of um, other things too, other business endeavors, et cetera? Yeah, I, I want to do, a, I, I have two follow-up books, I definitely, children's books I want to do. One is the, uh, the Cow Who Lost Her Listening Ears. Because my son, I, he, he just doesn't listen. <laughs> and, and I'm like, dude, where's your listening ears? Where are they? And uh, then he like, he puts them on and then he listens to what I'm saying. Um, and the other one is a uh, kind of a fun one. So my wife, 
Claire, who's just incredible. And the house you see behind me is, is, is mostly due to her being successful and bringing abundance into her life. <laughs> but uh, I met her at Molly Malone's at this, it was actually at a veterans event because I was running a, I, w- I was working like head of programs for a veterans and film and television at the time, a veteran based nonprofit in the entertainment industry. And we had an open mic night at this Molly Malone's and a friend of mine had invited her. So we had a few mutual acquaintances and she's really, she's like 5'10", so, but she's also very socially awkward. <laughs> and she's a tall girl, so she's standing out like heads above most everyone in there, just kind of being socially awkward. And I told her later, I'm like, and her hair, she has this crazy hair sometimes. And I'm like, you remind me of, you're like a hydrangea haired, soci- socially awkward, hydrangea j- haired giraffe. It's a lot to say. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm gonna make that into a children's book. It's called The Socially Awkward Hydrangea Haired Giraffe. It, it, again, kind of like, you know, the outcast maybe in a group and you're a little so you don't know how to get in there and be with everyone else, but you, you're probably the most amazing nugget in that crowd, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's going to be, I, I want to write that and, and see if I can get that published. Um, and then I have a couple TV series I wrote. So I'm, uh, um, one I'm really excited about is a guy named Satchel Page, who is a, uh, if you're not a baseball fan, he's widely known as probably the greatest pitcher ever. He was a black guy, started in the 1920s in Alabama, was relegated to the Negro Leagues for 20 years. And he has a lot of, you know, quotes and quips. He's kind of like the Mark Twain of baseball to me, just really funny. And he finally got, at age like 42, I think it was, the Cleveland Indians finally got him, uh, brought him up to the big leagues. And at the time, a lot of people wanted to bring him in instead of Jackie Robinson as the first black player. Mm-hmm. But he was too old. He was in his 40s by that time. They're like, no, we need a young guy. Anyway, but and he finally he made an all-star team. And he also he pitched for when he was 59 and a half years old, he pitched three shutout innings uh in the major leagues. Wow. And no one can be like 60 years old striking people out. Yeah, he even yeah. struck at age 65, he struck Hank Aaron out in uh in spring training with the wow. Atlanta Braves. Okay. Amazing story. Wow. And I want to get that story told about this guy. Cause you know, to me, that's like I mean, you want to talk about racism in the history of our country. That is just an incredible story. And the major leagues actually finally just last week came out and said, hey, we're going to recognize all the stats from the Negro Leagues as major league stats. Wow. They were just as good. Yeah. And they drew just as many fans back in the day as well. Um, so that's, to me, I, I, if anything could come to fruition, besides the children's books and the you are here, it's, it's finding someone to make that. Again, I have no, I have no real producer connections. So I want, it's about me just trying to send that to everyone. I just anyone and everyone, you know, and maybe someone will notice it and I can get it made. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I think you have a great 2021 planned out. Lots of great stuff to come. I, I, I hope you're right. Yeah. But I, I think as we get to this end of this year, I don't know how you approach the end of your year. I, I think it's important to, you have these goals, but I think you need to put them in writing and keep yeah. it simple. And I'll, I'll make out a letter of accomplishment every year of what I want to do uh, physically, family, my uh, social, you know, just friends and family, that type of thing, career wise. And I write those goals. And I'll tell you what, no matter how many, I could write this letter, or I could do it at the end of every year. And I might not pick it up or read it again until this time next year. But inevitably, you know what? At least half of those things are going to be mm. because I put it down in writing in somewhere. It's, it's in me somewhere that I knew I wanted to do that. Or I, I just put it out there. Right. So I think that's important, not just to have these goals and think about it. I think you got to put it in writing mm-hmm. and hey, print it out, tape it to your wall, put it in your desk, whatever. And, and you try to read it and consult it you know, throughout the year. But I think that's a powerful tool to, to move into 2021 is get these dreams down on paper. I like that. I know certain people do what's called vision boards, mm-hmm. which are kind of like similar, but a vision for sound all like woohoo and stuff like that. But it's basically the same idea. Just write down certain goals and write down certain accomplishments and always um there's even a like a an exercise people do where every night they'll write down three kind of good things that happened that day. And so these are great little mental practices to one focus but to be thankful. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think that's important to, yeah, at the end of the day, and I go through various phases of trying to write down what my accomplishments were for the day. And sometimes I'm just too exhausted or sometimes I feel like I did nothing. So I don't, I don't write it down. Mm-hmm. And I, 
but I, I do find something in my life consistently where I'm, where I feel good and I feel like I'm kind of humming along and I look back and it's because I am doing some journaling in the morning and writing down what I want to do for the day. And then I look back at the day and, and I, uh, and, and I write down the things I accomplished or, you know, I had a buddy who did a blog. He was a special forces guy over in Afghanistan, uh, Fr uh, France Hong, who was just an incredible individual. In fact, Jerry, I should have you remind me after this. I, I want you to connect with this guy. He's an Please. amazing dude. Okay. So when he was in uh, Afghanistan and he wrote this blog and I, and I ended up writing, I made a short film about him. So I ended up, I re re was reading his blog as part of the writing process. And he, he was just doing things that, the, you know, from this little hovel in Afghanistan, and he was listing the things maybe he did that day, but he'd be also be like, one thing I found funny. Mm. Every day was one, like one thing that was, and he was listing those kind of things at the end of each day. And to me, especially the one thing I found amusing, I, when you're out there doing missions in Afghanistan, you can find something funny every day when you're coming under fire. I think that's, I mean, and that's a brilliant way to, think about life or to show some appreciation no matter what happened is hey this is what made me laugh today and taking time to document it and remember it and make sure you appreciate it yeah exactly wow um so you served in afghanistan i i no i did not oh, i okay. my a lot of my friends from west point you know a lot of them are still in but you know a lot of them served in iraq and and afghanistan wow i ended up uh I got myself injured about a year in active duty on uh, on an airborne jump, jumping out of planes. Uh -huh. And I, I've had five surgeries and feet. I've had two hip surgeries, back surgery. I'm still dealing with a lot of the pain. Wow. So I got a medical discharge before I could uh, really go get deployed anywhere. I see. Which is which is what led me to acting. You know, honestly, I, I was going to have a military career. I was going to do you know, five years and going out of West Point. I only ended up doing a year because I got a medical discharge. Uh, and then that's when I first came out to Los Angeles. Mm. I, I was, I almost forgot what I was wanted to do. And I was in Atlanta and I got a job with frontier communications. And the night before I was supposed to start, I called the guy who hired me. I'm like, you know what? I'm not coming tomorrow. I'm going to move to Los Angeles to be an actor. So, nice. <laughs> nice. But I almost made that mistake of going out and making money and getting a corporate career. And at the last minute, I said, wait, what's your dream? And, and this was my dream. And yeah. I had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally feel you. Wow. So I think everyone watching, um, Jack's definitely going to be back. We'll definitely um, bring him back maybe in a few months. We'll reconnect and talk more about, about the creative process. Um, Jack, I actually just thought about one question, which is, do you find it's now – a little bit challenging to kind of balance family, you know, I got two kids, family, creativity, everything, or have you kind of found mostly a balance? I found no balance whatsoever. Oh. <laughs> and this year has been one of my most unproductive, it'd be mostly, you know, there's a lot of, I filmed two TV shows in January and then everything shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, and there just hasn't been work. But from the standpoint of trying to write in the house, when you just have these two kids around and what I had to do, there's a balance to be had and I haven't figured out, but most important to me is I had to find that way to give over to just enjoying the fact that I have these two kids that I get to spend time with them. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't really have any answers on the balance, but I, but I do know they're the most important thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if I, if I can find happiness in that, and again, it comes out to what the happiness in your life brings you. My career will, things in my career will happen because I'm happy and I'm a good father and I'm paying attention to my children and some good things will come and, and I will be able to find a balance in due time. But I think I'm mm -hmm. recognizing the most important thing. And, and it's also about not beating you. If you do have kids out there and you're like, I have these dreams, but I have these kids. And maybe you get a little resentful of the kids or the family and you just can't do that. I think mm -hmm. you need to say, Hey, this is the, cause why, why do we want success? What, what's the point of having success? If you don't have, it doesn't have to be kids in a, in a family, but if you don't have friends, you know, I mean, it's if you're not enjoying your friends or uh, getting out there, because that's what fulfills us, right? Yeah. And if you're just so focused on your dream that you're ignoring all your friends, you don't go have a coffee with someone. That's what li life is about. Life's not about this accomplishment. It's exactly. about, hey, what makes me happy? And, yeah. And the dreams, you know, your career can be part of that happiness, but it's never the full it's never the full pie, you know, yeah, it's never that yeah. full pie. 
and I mean, Jerry, how many times do you have you met people in life that do have money and they, they're successful and you're like, hey, maybe I want that. But then you realize they're not really all that happy, right? Yeah. 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 They always envy what a creative is doing or whatever, right? They, they're they making 10 times, 20 times, 100 times more money, but they're like, oh, I want to be in your spot. I can't tell you how many times over the years I had looked at my buddies from West Point and they're very successful and they're CEOs or, or maybe they went in, you know, somewhere making generals or colonel. They're having these and they have their families and they have what I, you know, as a single dude living in an apartment and up in LA and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I could be successful like them. I'm broke. I'm just I'm whatever. And inevitably so many of those guys would be like, we get together for some beers. They'd be like, Jack, tell me about your, it's so awesome that you're chasing your dream. And to them that was like, I wish I had chased my dream. And so the grass is all, we can make the grass always green. Right? Yes. We, we want to do that, right? And I think it's just not about, you can't make the grass. You can't say, hey, the grass is greener if I would just only do this. It's, you know, make your choices and learn to love your choices, no matter yeah. what the what kind of money it brings. Yes. Yes. 100%, man. I think that's a great stopping point, Jack. And right. yeah. um, I think we'll bring you back soon. I will put links to a lot of the topics we talked about in the description and pinned comments. So for viewers that see this, you'll get to follow up and do some research for yourself if you're inclined. That would, yes, I hope people, I hope people do watch this and I hope they share, you know, share with that. That's the most important thing you can do for guys like, like, like Jerry is, Hey, he, you put this out here. If you like it, share it with your network. And I know that you know, I, I will do that. And there's a lot of power in, in asking people to share. And if you want to do something, if you love what you're kind of, whether it's Jerry or anyone else you're watching, just share their stuff. Yes, and that's how you can it. help these creators who are doing this just out of passion and, yeah. and for what, for life. basically. Exactly. Exactly. Cool guys. This was Jerry learns business here with Jack Kennedy.